glioblastoma uh, is what we're going to focus uh, the talk on, and it sort of needs no introduction. I mean, you guys have gone over this uh, quite a bit, but um, it is the most common and the most deadly um, primary malignant brain cancer. This is uh, by definition grade four, and we get approximately 20,000 new diagnoses per year. Um, it's really, you know, been a focus in recent years with some pretty high profile um, people that have suffered from and died from uh, glioblastoma. And, you know, we've got pictures here of um, uh, Ted Kennedy, Bo Biden, and John McCain, who all uh, recently suffered and, and ultimately passed away from this. So it's certainly been more prevalent in the news media. Uh, current treatments for glioblastoma, you guys, uh, I think, heard a little bit about this before, but just to refresh everyone, um, basically, current therapies are pretty limited. Um, but, you know, this is an aggressive, aggressive disease. And without any treatment, you know, the average sort of lifespan is just a few months. Um, radiation makes a big impact and extends that to an average of sort of 10-ish months. A good uh, surgery, uh, in addition to that, extends it by a couple of months as well as chemotherapy sort of this in this sort of additive stepwise fashion. Average recurrence though, even despite all those therapies can still take place at around eight months. And really, you know, as we have uh, discovered lately, as we, we get more and more understanding of the genetic factors that go into these tumors, favorable genetic profiles like IDH mutation or um, MGMT methylation, all those kind of things can uh, tip the balance and make you know, median survivals um, in, in those kind of patients a little bit longer, and, but we're still talking about just a couple of years. Um, one thing that we know uh, and is sort of a tried and, and true thing is that surgery is unfortunately not a cure for this disease. And we know that from um, uh, historical um, uh, scenarios where, you know, in the 1920s, uh, uh, neurosurgeons like Walter Dandy would perform a hemispherectomy on patients with glioblastoma, you know, that is an anatomic resection of half of their brain. Uh, this is really, you know, a radical form of surgery uh, to um, try to tackle this disease. And even in those instances, those patients um, all still eventually succumb to disease from contralateral recurrence. And why is that? Well, the problem with diffuse gliomas is really that they're an infiltrative disease. Even though they look circumscribed on an MRI, malignant cells, even at the time of presentation, can extend well beyond anything we can see on MRI and often into the contralateral hemisphere. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, the high grade, the sort of central area of the, uh, that we see on the MRI, the sort of necrotic center and its contrast enhancing rim does contain um, uh, the highest number of malignant cells. And, you know, it's shown here sort of average number of cells that we're talking about for a three centimeter tumor, 10 to the 10th, six centimeters, 10 to the 11th. But even if we gross totally resect that contrast enhancing lesion and remove 99% of the cells, we still have 10 to the ninth uh, malignant cells, you know, this is, this is over a billion cells, which are, each one of which are capable of reforming a tumor. And these, again, you know, spread beyond the boundaries of conventional surgical resection. And we know this from uh, pathology studies, sampling, you know, taking um, uh, uh, autopsy specimens and sort of biopsying different areas at, at different distances from the tumor. And that's what's shown in the figure here is that, you know, even well beyond the margin of anything we see today on uh, the MRI, there's a, a high uh, infiltration of these malignant cells. And, you know, it gets scant, scanter and scanter as you get further away, but they're still there in each one, of course, is capable of reforming a tumor. So, you know, what are our therapeutic approaches and how, how does that, how do they match up with what we know about the pathology and the sort of, you know, microscopic features of this disease? You know, we have a tumor, like we said, we can see this pretty clearly and well, in a well demarcated fashion on an MRI. We can remove it with surgery. Uh, and then, you know, we apply some local regional therapies like radiation therapy, usually to a two centimeter margin around the, the resection cavity. We follow that up with chemotherapy, which is you know, designed to, uh, in cytotoxic chemotherapy, which is really designed to attack uh, rapidly dividing cells. And those are going to really hit areas of you know, higher density. But you know, the big question remains, you know, what are we going to do about those few individual cells that um, sort of escape away from the, these uh, current sort of standard therapies. Well, that's, you know, the area of active investigation. Um, what we're sort of dealing with now is, well, we've got these therapies and they do work, but we have to understand what to use and when and why. 
So surgical indications for these tumors, even knowing that they're a diffuse disease, are there. Uh, number one, we use these to confirm histologic diagnosis. We're not gonna understand how to use further treatments without uh, histology. Um, in today's era, you know, really we need extensive tissue sampling to perform comprehensive molecular analyses like genomic sequencing to really understand what potential molecular targets there would be and how to match those therefore with uh, follow-up treatments. Um, relieve mass effect, like we talked about before, an extensive tumor resection with, you know, gross total um, resection of a contrast enhancing lesion does lead to a rapid, you know, two log cell kill, uh, disrupts a microenvironment, which might um, therefore, you know, remove some resistant uh, cells. And, you know, we do know with good data that um, this form of cytoreduction does prolong survival significantly. Uh, in addition, uh, surgery, uh, surgical decompression, relief of mass effect, uh, restores neurologic function. And then all of this uh, also allows for the sort of potentiation or facilitation of those other treatments like radiation therapy and chemotherapy that aren't going to be feasible when someone's suffering from um, you know, intracranial hypertension from a very large tumor. And then, you know, finally, there is the ability for uh, surgeons to introduce local anti-neoplastic agents. And I, I think you heard a little bit about um, gliadel wafers and, and things like that from some of the other talks. Um, so, you know, when surgery is not really indicated, we talk about doing a stereotactic biopsy. This is a safe and feasible kind of procedure that we can do, but um, it's not always necessarily a good idea. Um, you know, this is minimally invasive, um, but, you know, in the situation of highly vascular tumors or potential non-tumors like aspergillosis or in people with uh, coagulopathies, uh, biopsy is obviously contraindicated. But even so, even with it being minimally inv invasive and in the right uh, situation, you can still have a substantial complication rate. So it's not you know, um, without its own issues and some of the sort of um, percentage chance of, of some of these things happening are listed there. And the diagram shows basically how a stereotactic biopsy is performed using neuronavigation and basically um, using that to plot a trajectory, drilling a burr hole and inserting a, a long needle uh, to depth of the target and sampling small tissue cores from that. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, one of the issues that we run into with biopsy is, you know, the small amount of tissue that we obtain is not really uh, enough in many instances to run some of these uh, more recent uh, advanced molecular analyses. So when we don't think uh, biopsy is a good idea, we're talking about an open surgery of craniotomy and resection of these tumors. Uh, shown in this diagram are some of the standard approaches to um, lesions in various uh, areas uh, of the uh, supertentorial space as well as infratentorial space. These are the, the sort of incision and craniotomies uh, that are typical um, for tumors in various regions. Um, again, uh, you know, with the difference, uh, you know, most commonly with primary high-grade tumors, we're talking about supertentorial rather than infratentorial, although there are um, plenty which occur in the cerebellum or brainstem. Uh, in, in general, craniotomy should just be done to provide a short distance between the, uh, the tumor and the surface of the brain and big enough to allow some relaxation of the brain so it doesn't uh, herniate out as you um, open uh, the dura. Um, once the exposure and the approach is made, pathways into the lesion are sort of shown in this diagram here, which is one of these uh, wonderful uh, pieces of art from uh, Ian Souk, who is at, um, at MD Anderson um, previously. And uh, this shows um, the sort of various ways to reach a tumor at different depths. Uh, certainly one of the more common would be something presenting on, this, uh, on or near the surface. This is really probably the most relevant for um, malignant glioma to be a sort of a transcortical approach and defining which areas of the cortex you can really um, uh, remove along with the tumor. Um, in deeper areas, such as the insula, you might uh, take an approach that goes um, uh, through normal anatomic corridors, um, uh, like the sylvian fissure, or the interhemispheric fissure to reach uh, a tumor in the lateral ventricle through the trans um, uh, colossal approach. And then other more deep seated tumors, and this probably applies a little bit more to brain metastases than it does for primary tumors, um, might be a transsocal 
approach, taking advantage of normal sort of anatomic um, uh, avenues uh, to reach deeper into the brain without violating uh, otherwise normal uh, areas of, of brain. Uh, all this is to say that surgery in experienced hands is safe and feasible, you know, um, uh, and with, I think, in my opinion, relatively comparable to maybe slightly higher complication rate to um, biopsies. Uh, shown here is data from a very large series. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.